Just over a century ago, the motion camera was invented and changed forever the way we recall our history. For the first time, we could see life through the eyes of ordinary people. Across this series, we'll bring these rare archive films back to life with the help of our vintage mobile cinema. We'll be inviting people with a story to tell to step on board and relive moments they thought were gone forever. They'll see their relatives on screen for the first time, come face to face with their younger selves and celebrate our amazing 20th century past. This is the people's story, our story. Our vintage mobile cinema was originally commissioned in 1967 to show training films to workers. Today it's been lovingly restored and loaded up with remarkable film footage preserved for us by the British Film Institute and other national and regional film archives. In this series we'll be travelling to towns and cities across the country and showing films from the 20th century that give us the real history of Britain. Today we're pulling up in the glamorous Roaring Twenties to discover how the other half lived and find out about a group of bright young people who created Britain's first cult of celebrity. This is Clifton in Berkshire the house in the 1920s of the second Viscount Waldorf Astor and his American wife Nancy. The Astors were one of the grandest and wealthiest families in the world and it was here in this house that many of the parties and events took place that mark out the rich, roaring twenties. Coming up, the tragic story of Britain's original It Girl my grandfather got a telegram from London saying, regret to inform you, um, Elizabeth has died. It was alcoholic poisoning. She had drunk herself to death. Lord Astor returns to his ancestral home to give us a guided tour. And you can see up there is Amy Johnson, Charlie Chaplin, my grandmother, George Bernard Shaw. And a glimpse of what life was like for Clifton's formidable head butler, Edwin Lee. Lady Astor called him Lord Lee of Clifton. They couldn't operate without him. He was essential. We're at the stately home of Clifton today to catch a glimpse of life as it was lived by a small group of privileged, rich people who defined what became known as the Roaring Twenties. The traumas of the First World War convinced a new generation to live for the moment, and by the 1920s, decadence and the jazz age were in full swing. Indulgent fads and madcap antics were all the rage. Women, who now had the vote, shockingly cropped their hair and their hemlines. But the 20s was a decade of huge contrast. While workers faced extreme poverty and crippling unemployment, a small group of young, rich socialites in London were living it up like there was no tomorrow. The tabloid press dubbed them the bright young people, creating possibly the first celebrities to be famous for being famous. My guests here today have come from all over the country to share their family history stories of the Roaring Twenties. They'll be showing us photo albums, scrapbooks and treasured mementos. Many of them will be seeing the films we are about to screen for the first time. 
Joining us today is Laura Ponsonby from Surrey. She has some vivid stories to share about her aunt, Elizabeth Ponsonby, one of the most famous it girls of that decade. She was really the sort of leader of the bright young people, but unlike many of the bright young people, she was not rich. My grandmother, she writes a very good and critical diary. She said about Elizabeth, she lives as though she's got 3,000 a year and will spend 800 on a dress. But really, her family, Elizabeth's family, what sometimes people call the aristocratic poor, they had no money. And I do have a photograph, if you would like to look at it in here. I would, certainly. It, it, it's a little bit tender, so maybe I, you... I, if I hold it... If you hold it... I'll hold it, you I'll can open, open it. Yeah, yeah. This is Elizabeth's scrapbook, and she's put in the various photographs of these many, many parties she went Heather to. Heather Pilkington party, summer 1927. Um, and there is Elizabeth in the middle. And, and next to her and is... And that is Brian Howard. Uh, somebody wrote a book called, about him. He was a poet and writer, Portrait of a Failure. But he was always seemed to be around. And I think this is probably Cecil Beaton dressed C up. Cecil Beaton dressed, yes, so that's an yes. impersonation party. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Not at all. Well, wonderful to meet you. Yeah, wonderful yes. to meet you. We're about to show Laura some films that will take her back to a time when her aunt Elizabeth was a 1920s reveller. What family stories will they bring to mind? She was absolutely mad for partying. I mean, she was in and out of the nightclubs, always doing. She loved dancing. She loved music. You know, she, she really enjoy, enjoyed that sort of thing and was up all hours of the night. The daughter of a prominent Labour politician, Elizabeth became known for her high jinks, stealing policemen's helmets and breaking into stately homes. For Elizabeth and her chums, life was one long party. These bright young people all got together and had all these different themed parties. So they had um, the bath and uh, bottle party, which was in a swimming pool. They had the uh, impersonation party, where everybody went to something else. They had the white party, and everybody was dressed in white. They had the red and white party. They had the Mozart party. They had the American party. They were always dressing up. Sometimes they weren't in their ordinary clothes for several days. And, of course, they were drinking. Laura tells us how Elizabeth's parents were shocked by her numerous affairs. She was mad about men, frankly. And um, her mother does write in her, one of her diaries or reflections about Elizabeth. She says, what a pity that Elizabeth knew about contraception because she wouldn't have risked herself with so many men. Pleasure-seeking parties were a feature of the time, but they had their dark side too. According to Diana Mosley, who was also a bright young person at that particular time, she felt that Elizabeth was a person who introduced cocaine um, in, into the scene of the bright young people. And there was one um, daughter of a baronet called Brenda Dean Paul, who was quite uh, rather striking, I think, and went to these parties. And she was really addicted to cocaine, and I think she was in prison. To the dismay of her parents, Elizabeth refused to settle down and continued to party into the 1930s. Laura tells the sad story of her death at the age of 39. Well, she died in 1940, and my grandfather got a telegram from London saying, regret to inform you. Um, Elizabeth has died. He'd seen her, I think, about a month before, but they'd been seeing much less of her, in fact. And it was alcoholic poisoning. She had drunk herself to death, which was a, a desperate, desperate thing. And, of course, the grandparents were shattered. Laura's family have kept many mementos of Elizabeth's short life, like this poignant letter written after an unknown scandal. Dearest mother, I am writing to tell you how frightfully sorry I am for hurting you and father. From nobody's fault, I have had to make my own life, and I may not have made it very well, but there it is. But whatever I may think or do, the last thing in the world that I ever wished to do was to hurt you so much. I may be treading a road that leads nowhere, but perhaps it is better than scrambling about in a desert. Try and forgive me. Ever your loving, Elizabeth.
To find out more about the bright young people of the 1920s, I'm meeting up with the writer and historian Lucy Moore inside Clibden House. Hello, Lucy. Hello. How are you? Melvin Bragg. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. A seat. Thank you. People talked about the bright young things. Well, who were the bright young things? Um, the bright young things were the sort of socialites of the 1920s. They were a group of people who embraced a kind of quite a broad section of society for the first time. So you had impoverished artists, you had daughters of peers, you had uh, daughters of labour politicians, you had all sorts of people mixed up together and what they had in common was that they were young, they hadn't been involved in the war. What about the attention to, well, young people always pay attention to their parents, but it seemed to be, ex not excessive, but they had a lot of fun with it, didn't they? Oh, absolutely, and there's certainly a sense that girls were dressing as boys, boys were dressing as girls. Um, there was a massive influence, obviously, of Hollywood, so you get everyone you know, slicks their hair down like Rudolph Valentino and tries to dance the tango with a rose in their mouth. And that's because media had totally changed. For, for the first time, you could, you know, go and see a movie that everyone else was seeing. The new fashions and fads of the 1920s were limited to the few who could afford them. Mass unemployment brought thousands of ordinary families to the point of destitution. And by 1921, two and a half million workers were out of a job. In the 20s, there were a lot of people in this country going through very hard times. How did they feel about what was going on? I suspect that most of the population of England at the time was half horrified and half fascinated by them. But there was an emptiness about what they were doing, and I'm sure that the bulk of the population who were on strike or, you know, suffering from the, the desperate economic situation post-war would have looked at these people and thought, what are they doing with their lives? <laughs> I'm now off to meet someone who has a very personal connection to one of the bright young people of the Roaring Twenties. Simon Blow is the great-nephew of Stephen Tennant, the most flamboyant of the 24-hour party people. He would often wear makeup and gold dust in his hair. Uncle Stephen was um, a carefree person, really, in the early twenties. I mean, he had, he had the world at his feet. He had looks, he had talent. Um, you know, background connections and everything. He was a glamour figure, really, and he was very beautiful. Well, you say very beautiful. He liked to, he liked to dress as a woman, too, didn't he? Well, he didn't go completely into drag. No. Um, but conventional society said it's not surprising. His mother dressed him as a girl until he was 12. <laughs> as a young man in the 1970s and 80s, Simon enjoyed a close relationship with his then ageing great-uncle, and would spend long periods with him at the Tennant family estate in Wiltshire. You brought a photograph of your Uncle Stephen. Yes, this is one of Uncle Stephen which he gave to me. Well, that's him before he put makeup on. He did the later um, sketching himself. He once said to me, Have you noticed, Simon, how beautifully chiselled my nose is? <laughs> So I said, yes, and he looked, he was looking up from his bed, and he lay back on his pillows and sort of thought, and then he looked at me and he said, and you have a very chiselled nose too. <laughs> and then there was more thinking on the pillows, and he said, oh, I think most well-bred people have chiselled noses. <laughs> <laughs> not a bit, not a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Simon boards our mobile cinema, where we're about to screen some rare film footage of life in 1920s Britain. Will these films conjure up the atmosphere of the era when his uncle Stephen was the toast of the smart set in London? It made me, in a way, quite nostalgic for a world I'd never known. I think that uh, um, there was a feeling of cheerfulness in, in, the, in the films, really. And I think you do get the sense of jollity that happened after the ending of the First World War. Simon's great uncle Stephen was the youngest son of Lord and Lady Glen Connor. Because of his class and privilege, he never had to work. I think he always hoped that he would be a famous writer. Um, but then he wanted to be a famous beauty too. And there's a lovely story about Claire, my grandmother. He was staying, staying in a country house in Wales. 
and uh, Michael Duff, the host, um, was waiting for Stephen, there's a house party, to come down for dinner. And they waited, and so finally Michael went up to Stephen's room and said, we're all waiting for you, Stephen, you must come down. And he was putting on the last duchess of makeup. And he turned round from looking in the glass and said to Michael, Michael, tell me I'm as beautiful as Claire. So there was this desire to be as beautiful as his sister. So that was all part of the thing. He loved dressing up. He once said to me, I can't bear trousers, Simon. I only like clothes that drape. He was very high-spirited, and, you know, he threw all sorts of parties at Wilsford when he owned the house. He had a following. He was a, he was a sort of magical name, Stephen Tennant. And, um, and the world lay at his feet. Stephen Tennant outlived most of his contemporaries and passed away in 1987. He'd been a recluse and chose to spend much of the last 17 years of his life in bed. Often when I stayed with Uncle Stephen, I used to look through the old photographs and sort of romance about those times in my head. Uh, I think they would have been great times to have experienced. On Real History Today, we're in the grounds of the magnificent Cliveden House in Berkshire. During the Roaring Twenties, it was home to the wealthy Astor family, who famously entertained on a lavish scale. Forty-three years ago, the Astor family leased Cliveden to the National Trust, and the house became a luxury hotel, with the gardens open to the public. But the current Lord Astor has returned today to show us around. We're heading through the Great Hall to the French dining room. This French dining room, which my great-grandfather, he bought the interior of the room from um, one of the houses in Versailles. And according to his notes, when he got it here, it still had bullet holes and some of the panelling left over from the French Revolution. <laughs> that really makes it authentic. Yeah. <laughs> Lord Astor's grandfather, Waldorf, inherited Clifton and an immense fortune from his American father, who built the luxurious Waldorf Hotel in New York. Waldorf married Nancy, a very rich American heiress, in 1906, and together they had four sons and a daughter. The picture over there is probably the most famous picture of the um, 20th century of my grandmother. It was painted by Sargent when she was originally drawn out. She had um, my uncle was being carried piggyback when they, they decided to actually do the picture. They said not to do that. You wouldn't normally have someone looking over their left shoulder. Cliveden soon became a centre of social and political influence. In 1919, Nancy Astor made history when she became the first woman to take her seat in Parliament. You can see up there is Amy Johnson, Charlie Chaplin, my grandmother, George Bernard Shaw. Why was he such a regular visitor? He was a great friend of my grandmother, and they, went, they did various trips together in Europe. They went to both Berlin and Moscow. That's my uh, grandmother, the Duke of Windsor, up there, playing golf. So what did they say to you about the 20s? Clifton in the 20s and 30s was a kind of political salon, as it were, and she had lots of friends from, uh, whether it was the arts, whether it was George Bernard Shaw, Lawrence Arabia was a great friend. She had an extraordinary kind of range of people who came here and they had this extraordinary house which they kind of entertained. During the 1920s, many of the stately homes of Britain were a continuous social whirl of parties and entertaining. It required battalions of servants. We're now going to find out what life was like downstairs from the relatives of those who worked here at Cliveden during that time. Martin Blavers joined us today from Hampshire. He's here to tell us about his uncle, Edwin Lee, who was head butler to the Astors at Clibden for 44 years. Well, my uncle was here from 1919 to 1963, I think it was, he finally packed up. And what did he say about working for the Astors? Well, he, 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 it was his whole life. 
I sort of realised that the reason he, he stuck it here and he did so well was because he was a strong man. He had a strong personality. He stood up to no, Lady no. Astor. He wouldn't take any, any stick. But what about the working hours? I've read notes about it. Can you tell us about the working hours? Well, he always told me that it was sometimes 18-hour days, seven days a week. They had to, he had to run this place here and St James's in London. Also, obviously, Christmas, Easter, that yeah. was permanent work. But he enjoyed it. He was his whole life. Martin's about to watch some rarely seen film footage of the Astor family that'll take him back to the time when his uncle, Edwin, served as their butler. When Kodak introduced a portable cine camera in 1923, amateur filmmaking took off. But it was a novelty pastime for wealthy enthusiasts like the Astors, who recorded many home movies during the interwar years. These films paint an intimate picture of their lifestyle. Until today, Martin had no idea these films existed. Will he spot his Uncle Edwin? I did actually catch a glimpse of my uncle. He looked so much younger, because what my main sort of um, meetings with him were after he'd retired. I, I didn't see him very much when he worked here because, well, he was just busy seven days, days a week. Um, so it was good to see him looking. He looked very jovial. Um, he, he was laughing. That was really good. During the 1920s, the butler in a stately home would be the highest ranking servant in charge of all the domestic staff. Martin's uncle Edwin was renowned in his day and to be trained by him was a reference in itself. He was like the managing director of a large company. He organized all the staff, the functions, ordering all the, the wine. Um, he just managed a large household. I would look, relate it today to running probably a company of 400 people as a managing director. Lady Astor called him Lord Lee of Clifton um, because he was, in some ways, he was as a part of the structure and fixtures and fittings, as you might say. They couldn't operate without him. He was essential. As a society hostess, Lady Nancy Astor earned a reputation for witty repartee. But as her butler, Martin's uncle Edwin was privy to other sides of her character. I think he, just, he respected her greatly, but he realised that she was a tyrant. He told me a story of um, when she came back from Parliament late one night, probably in a pretty bad mood because something had gone wrong. He'd already organised a, a, a massive banqueting table for royalty who were coming in the next day. It was all set up with flowers and everything. She walked in and took one look at it, kicked her shoes off, jumped up on the table and started moving things around, saying, I don't like the look of that, etc., etc. Water was getting spilt, so he just walked in and said, Lady Astor, if you don't get off that table, I'm going. So she just jumped, she apparently jumped down, put her shoes back on and said, um, leave it to you, Lee, and walked out. And that was that, that was the sort of relationship. Martin's uncle went into semi-retirement in 1953 and married Emily, who was a telephonist at Cliveden for many years. It was his whole life. I would say that um, he's like a piece of rock with Cliveden written through him. I mean, whenever I used to visit him after he'd retired, we'd have lunch, and because my aunt worked here as well for 20-odd years, the, the, it always, the conversation would always, always return to the Astors and Cliveden and all the other people that they would know through that. It was just, it was his whole life. And he had a good life doing it. Martin's uncle Edwin was responsible for the smooth running of Cliveden. Now we're off to meet someone who can reveal what life at its most intimate was like with Lady Astor. Hello, Anne. Hello. How are you? Anne Norris has joined us today from North Yorkshire. Anne's aunt, Rose Harrison, had the remarkable experience of being lady's maid to the fiery Lady Astor for 35 years. She had to um, look after her completely, run her baths, get all her clothes ready, um, 
mend anything that needed mending, look after the jewellery, more or less take care of her altogether. But my aunt was very uh, lucky, really, because she went all over the world with her. Everywhere Lady Astor went, my aunt went with her, and she travelled first class, went to some marvellous places. So she was very fortunate. She loved her job. It was hard work, but she really enjoyed it. Anne's about to watch the Astor's home movies, which she's never seen before. The films will show her a hidden portrait of the life her aunt lived as a 1920s ladies' maid in one of Britain's wealthiest families. I watched the films and they were absolutely fantastic and it's so nice to see different parts of the Astor family, the places where they played and um, lived and it's been really, really nice to see that and to see where my aunt might have been. Right from the start, Rose had the strength of character to take on the formidable Lady Astor. I think my aunt was the only one that really stood up to Lady Astor and um, she'd had a few ladies' maids before that they didn't last very long. There was one incident where Lady Astor had a box of chocolates and she took a bite into one of them and didn't like it, so she gave it to my aunt. And um, my aunt looked at it, put it in the waste paper basket and said, I'm not that hard up that I have to have second-hand chocolates, so she never kind of um, did that again. <laughs> As lady's maid to Nancy Astor, Rose enjoyed a higher social status than the other housemaids. She also travelled all over the world with the Astors, who filmed many of their glamorous holidays abroad. I think as my aunt's life and Lady Astor's life matured, um, they seemed to become more uh, compatible and more friends rather than uh, maid and, and mistress. I think she was really, really upset when Lady Astor passed away. Lady Astor had asked her earlier on in her life never to leave her, and she promised she'd stay with her forever. And um, when she did actually pass away, I think it really hit home. The only thing that she brought away from uh, the house was the uh, Lady Astor's dog who was called Madam, and she was a Madam too. Uh, I think she was a little Pekingese, and she used to have a little basket at my aunt's house, and uh, you would never go near her because she was spoilt rotten and a little bit snappy. <laughs> but uh, it was something to remember her ladyship by. The Astors were generous with their wealth and gave buildings, land and money to the city of Plymouth. But throughout the interwar years, they famously continued to entertain at Cliveden. However, it was a different story for the racy London set. The bright young things we've been talking about had the celebrity then in the 1920s of today's pop stars and sports stars. But in the 1920s, there was an enormous depression and eventually the press was to turn against them. By the 1930s, a war was brewing in Europe and the beautiful people began to disperse leaving behind their legacy of modern celebrity. Whether or not we should thank them for that, the jury's out. Next time on Real History, we're at Osterley Park in Middlesex to honour the brave Home Guard soldiers of World War II. I joined the Home Guard because I wanted to do my bit. I wanted a future, and I knew that future wouldn't exist if the invasion took place. Coming down the tracks next on BBC Two, Neil Oliver and some wonderful steam trains on the coast. Or on BBC One, Sir Roger Moore is the guest on The One Show. <laughs>